Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Good morning. It's very nice to see everybody here. I know um, some of you are here in the sanctuary, obviously, and others of you are worshiping with us home from home, virtually. So welcome to all. I know some of us are still on vacation. It's great to see Rich and Carol back again. Um, some of us are uh, among the walking wounded, I'm afraid. We still have uh, Nancy recovering. Um, I hope she's doing well. And uh, our dear Esther also took a little spill, and her knee is all bandaged up. Yeah. But um, we have everyone in our thoughts and our prayers, and uh, hope to see everyone back again next week. our call to worship this morning. We've come to worship God, who makes streams flow from rock, who turns the parched earth into springs of water, who sends the rain from heaven and makes the wilderness blossom and flourish. As the deer thirsts for flowing streams, so we thirst for you, O God. Come, let us worship our life-giving God who pours out living water on all who thirst. Please stand and let us sing our praises to God. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. 
fields The hope of the world born for us And all who believe Him And all who receive Him Are children born of God Jesus Messiah The promise fulfilled The hope of the world born for us And all who believe Him And all who receive Him Thanks to that uh, father-son duo who graciously came yesterday to uh, record our song for us. Our prayer of confession this morning is um, a responsive prayer. It's up on the screen. If you would please play, pray responsively with me. Oh Lord, forgive us when we fail to respond to your call with faith. Forgive us when we are shackled by our narrow understandings of discipleship and our clouded sense of purpose. Forgive us when we are frightened of the future or pull back from the demand of your calling. Forgive us when we fail to sense your presence in our past, to acknowledge your grace in the present moment, and to trust you for our future. We stand together as your disciples. We seek renewed and renewing faith. Touch us now with your spirit, Lord. Touch us now with your spirit. But hear these words of assurance from the book of Romans. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ, the law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. The spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Amen and amen. Once again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Monocacy Valley Church, either here in person or online on our YouTube channel. Pastor Isaiah returns from his vacation beginning on Tuesday, and we're happy to have him back. I'd remind you of our matching funds drive for our Promising Horizons Learning Center. You may give via a check to the church office or online at Tidely. We are working on a separate account on Tidely. If you make a contribution online, please call the church office to let them know. You may have noticed it's a bit brighter in the sanctuary this morning. A few of us worked on spotlights yesterday, and special thanks go out to Brian and Chris Borson for their help. MVC's virtual ministries continue via Zoom. The Cancer Support Group meets every Friday morning at 10 a.m. The next meeting of the Men's Bible Study is on Saturday morning, September 12th at 8.30 a.m. 
The next women's Bible study is Thursday evening, September 17th at 7 p.m. And as always, please remember your donations to the Frederick Food Bank. And now let's continue with worship. instrumental talents as well. Well, even though we introduced Lydia in our story last week about Paul, I told you that we'd be taking a closer look at her and the important part that she played in the establishment of the early Christian church. 
So our scripture today may sound somewhat familiar. Hopefully, you'll see how it all comes together. Our scripture is Acts 16, 13 through 15, and verse 40. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and the sisters, and they encouraged them. And then they left. Please join with me in our morning prayer. <clears throat> Forgiving and gracious Lord, we come here today with so many things on our hearts. We've managed to almost get through this strange summer of social distancing and are now, still with lingering confusion, heading toward the complexities of autumn. And these next months for many will contain higher levels of anxiety and worry. Teachers and students are going back to school in a variety of ways, but all those ways look very different this year. The hurricane season has already turned violent with, with much loss of both property and human life. The holidays are already causing stress because of the probable disruption to what are typically annual joyous gatherings of family and friends. A heated national election is looming. And concerns for the upcoming flu season are now beginning to pile on top of the already catastrophic COVID pandemic. <clears throat> Lord, convict us <clears throat> of the importance of paying attention to the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs that we are all facing. Spur us on to reach out to someone who is elderly or ill, someone who is mourning the death of a loved one, someone whose job loss has left them hungry, someone who feels lost and alone, or someone who is just trying to find their way. Have us pattern our actions after Jesus who prayed to you for each of us and for the whole world, who taught us how to be people of compassion and concern, who modeled how to lean on you, Father, for all things. So today, we bring our concerns, anxieties, and worries to you because we know that you hear us. We ask that you remove these burdens from us and free us to put our trust in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. <clears throat> well, I grew up in a house that really started out as a summer camp. It had a dirt basement, not much insulation, not even many rooms. But it did have several ingratiating features. A hand-built field stone fireplace and a large open air porch from which you could look down a steep hill to the Winanskill Creek. As a child, I viewed that creek as a formidable challenge. 
wide and deep enough that even a sturdy log thrown across was not enough to calm my fear of losing my balance and falling into the waters below. But despite having what appeared to be this adequate source of water, the well at our house would inevitably run dry every summer. Now, we did not have well digging, well digging rigs, say that fast 10 times, well digging rigs back then. So our well had been dug by hand, mostly by my father's hand. I remember hot August days when Daddy would put on his Preston's Army Navy overalls and a pair of camouflage green rubber boots. He would then climb into the 20-foot deep well shaft, which was really no wider than the width of his shoulders and lined with concrete. He had a ladder, but it was not long enough to accommodate the full depth of the well. So he would lower it to the bottom on ropes and then rappel his way down the rest of the well shaft to meet the ladder. Once at the bottom, he dug to a new water level by shoveling dirt into a bucket on a pulley, which my brothers would then raise to the surface and dump. It was a dirty, tedious, and frankly, dangerous job. And when I think back on it, I don't recall being as appreciative of it as I should have been. But my father was committed to the task for his family, which he knew was the only way he could provide us with clean and consistent water. Hmm. Water. It is life-giving, and that is good. Scientists tell us that our human body weight consists of between 60 to 70 percent water. Water can also be destructive, as we have seen this past week with Hurricane Laura. But today, our scripture focuses on transformative, life-giving water. And it is everywhere in our text. Now, if you recall from last week, when Paul arrived in pagan Philippi, the Holy Spirit had already strategically provided the apostle with a person who would both hear the good news, share it, and act on it. And that person was Lydia. She was to become not only the first Christian convert in Europe, but also the, ho the host of the first house church in Philippi. In this way, she became a major player in the spread of the gospel to the rest of the known world. Now, water plays a critical part in Lydia's life. It's present in her story in at least three ways. It enables her to make a living. It creates an environment in which she can worship. And it becomes the spiritual basis for her future life. Let's look at each of these ways. Now, Lydia's hometown of Thyatira was known for its dye works, particularly purple dye, used in the fabrication of luxury purple cloth. Obtaining the necessary dye for this enterprise was a difficult and very expensive proposition. It involved gathering murex ocean shells, especially a special family of shells that discharged a purple ink to protect the snail from predators. Murex snails were then crushed and boiled in salt water for several days to extract the ink, which was then used in the textile industry. It was said that 12,000 snails were needed in order to dye just the trim of one garment. Now, since Philippi was near the Aegean Sea, Lydia might have actually been engaged in this watery business of extracting expensive ink herself. However, she also could have imported fabric from Thyatira or elsewhere 
making use of that famous Roman road we spoke of last week, the Via Ignacia, to deliver these luxury goods to her elite clientele. In fact, purple cloth became such an important status symbol and was so sought after that the Romans passed a sumptuary law which mandated that only those of high government rank or their elite friends could wear it. It appears that Lydia's life and livelihood were pretty well set. She was economically interdependent with the elite of Philippi. Her household probably included dependent workers as well as slaves who carried out her textile business for her. Her income likely allowed for a house that was large enough to serve both as a home and also as a center for her commerce. Biblical history tells us that larger houses like this were often where the early Christians would meet. Now, just as water provided the raw materials that were critical to Lydia's trade, water also provided an appropriate environment for her spiritual life. When Paul first meets Lydia, it is the Sabbath, and she is at a place of prayer, an outdoor informal worship site outside the city gates. This because Philippi had too few Jews to establish a true synagogue within the city limits. And as was typical, this place of prayer was located near a river, probably the Gangites River, which is actually that picture right there. That's the Gangites River near Philippi. A source of water like this was important for these makeshift synagogues because water was required for ritual washings that were part of the Jewish worship. Now remember that Lydia was a God-fearer, a Gentile attracted to the religious and moral practices of the Jews, but not a true convert to Judaism. So Lydia listened to Paul's message of the good news that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah and that he saved all who believed in him and that all, including Gentiles like herself, could become one in him. Next, scripture states that the Lord opens Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. And her response is action. First, she submits to baptism. And then, since she is the head of a household, her entire house is baptized along with her. Ironically, Paul used the very same Gangites river water to baptize Lydia that she had probably used for Jewish purification rituals. But this was water that Lydia had not experienced in her life before. This water was the living water gushing to eternal life that Jesus had offered to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. And the importance of this water was found in the command that Jesus had given to his disciples when he told them to go into the world making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Never before this moment had Lydia heard of God's Son who had lived, died, and risen for her, nor of Jesus' promise that he would provide a counselor, a guide, and a comforter in the person of the Holy Spirit, someone who would walk with her every day. Immediately, Lydia knew that the promise of this water into which she had been immersed changes everything. And that led to Lydia's next seemingly startling invitation, at least by today's standards. She said to Paul, well, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. 
Now this might be what we would label radical hospitality. That Lydia is so moved by the words of a perfect stranger that she is willing to open up her home to him might to us today seem extremely risky. Hospitality in the ancient world was considered an important courtesy. So Lydia's offer to Paul could simply have underscored her willingness to fulfill that cultural expectation. However, I believe that the baptismal transformation which she and her entire household had just experienced is also at play. For example, Lydia certainly understood her clients, and she might have been worried about her business of purple cloth, which so relied on her approval ratings from the rich and the ruling classes of Philippi. And weren't those the very same magistrates who later, in this same chapter of Acts 16, will strip Paul, beat him, and throw him in prison? because he advocates customs that are not lawful for Romans to adopt or observe? And what about Lydia's acceptance of this Jesus Christ, who if he is the Messiah or the anointed successor to King David, is most definitely a threat to the Roman state? Could she not then be seen as a traitor? Could Lydia not be accused of reaping the benefits of a good income from Rome while harboring representatives of Christianity in her own home? Now, we don't know if Lydia worried about any of these repercussions that might have resulted from her conversion to Christianity. What we do know is that she unhesitatingly accepted the Messiah as her Lord and Savior, was baptized, and immediately offered her home as a place of welcome and worship. Now, if you look at our RCA denominational liturgy for baptism, you will see that one of the results of baptism is that we are adopted into the body of Christ, the community of believers the church worldwide. And the now baptized Lydia proceeded to offer that church what she had, her hospitality. And in so doing, Lydia became the leader of the first European house church. The last sentence of our scripture today says, they went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. This describes Paul's last stop before departing Philippi. Already, there are brothers and sisters at Lydia's house, perhaps sitting on tops of piles of purple cloth, who knows, who are living in Christian community. And writing from prison years later, Paul cites the Philippian church as one that had grown into the most faithful and generous of all the early churches. So if Lydia were here today with us, what might she say? I can imagine her sharing some life lessons, maybe something like these. Do not neglect prayer. Lydia and Paul met in a place of prayer. And where there was prayer, new life occurred. Prayer is our conduit to new life in Christ. She might say, find places and times when you are able to listen to God. Because when Lydia eagerly listened to God's voice, he opened her heart to his will and his purposes. She might say, once you clearly understand the next step that God wants you to take, make bold decisions that are in line with his will. We can see now that Lydia opened her home not in any risky fashion, but in keeping with the movement of the Spirit and in accordance with God's plan. 
and God uses her home and her influence mightily for the growth of his church. Lydia offered what she had for God's purposes. We should do the same. And sometimes what you have is the thing that's right in front of you. For Lydia, that was her hospitality. And share. God's works in partnership with other people, often people who are not like us, to accomplish his purposes, his aims, and his goals. Lydia was a Gentile. Paul was a Jew. But God used them both and together to further his plan for the entire world. So as Paul was led to Philippi by the Holy Spirit to be used by God, so too did the Spirit open Lydia's heart to receive Christ's call on her life and the consequential call it was. Yes, my dear earthly father did whatever it took to provide us with water when we needed it. But our heavenly father transforms us through the waters of baptism to provide us with life everlasting. For as Jesus has said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear God, teach us to pray, to listen, and to discern your will. Have us take our baptism seriously and come alongside us as we make bold decisions that will help further your kingdom. And remind us to give all our worries to you so that we are free to simply listen for your direction as we travel. Amen. Please stand for our closing song.
wrong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Thank you, Lori. We have such talent in our people, in our church. What a blessing. So now receive the benediction. Continue your journey faithfully with God, offering what you have to give while trusting him with the plans for your life. And may the blessing of God Almighty the love of the, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the ever-present Holy Spirit be with you now, forever and ever. Amen and amen. Go in peace. <laughs>